Hello viewers, and welcome to the latest installment of the LOTR LCG Progression Series, a production by Cardboard of the Rings, the bi-weekly podcast about the Lord of the Rings, the card game, which is a living card game by Fantasy Flight Games. My name is Mitch. And I'm Matthew. And today we're going to be taking a look at the one new hero card and nine new player cards of the first adventure pack of the Against the Shadow Cycle of Adventure Packs. This is the Steward's Fear. So to take a look at our new hero, Matthew, why don't you start us off? Sure. Our new hero is Hirluin the Fair, uh, a leadership hero with a threat cost of eight, one willpower, uh, one across the board, actually. One willpower, one attack strength, one defense strength, and then four hit points. Herolin is an Outlands character with the ranged keyword, and you may use resources from Herolin the Fair's resource pool to pay for Outlands ally cards of any sphere. So, without getting into his special ability, I think there's two things of note to me. One is that he's our first ranged hero that doesn't belong to the tactics sphere, and he's uh, one of the few heroes where their stats do not add up to the threat cost. His threat cost is 8, his stats add up to 7. So both of those things, again, to me, are, are somewhat interesting, but where he really shines is his ability to pay for Outland's allies, uh, which we will be talking about shortly. I think you're exactly right. There's not much use in talking about Hirlu in the Fair without introducing our Outlands allies and the concept of the Outlands trait. So previously, in the Heirs of Numenor expansion, we had seen one character named the Hunter of Lamadon, who had an ability where once you play him from your hand, you discard the top card of your deck. If it just so happens to have the Outlands trait, you add that card to your hand. That seemed a little bit strange, because at the time that was the only Outlands character. And now we have an Outlands hero. Of course, he's never going to be part of your deck, but he kind of introduces the Outlands synergy. So this adventure pack introduces four different Outlands allies, each of them belonging to a different sphere of influence. Two of them are one-cost characters, and the other two are two-cost characters, just like the Hunter of Lamadon himself. So, just a single adventure pack beyond the Heirs of Numenor Deluxe expansion, we've already seen five total Outlands allies. And the Outlands synergy hinges upon the concept of these characters entering play and then all enhancing one another. So the Hunter is kind of an odd duck among the Outlands allies that we're going to be covering for this adventure adventure pack. So, to introduce our specific Outlands allies, for two cost characters we have the Warrior of Losernok for the Leadership Sphere, and we also have the Athir Swordsman for Spirit. Both of these characters have one willpower, one attack, one defense, and one hit point. They each have that Outlands trait, but their abilities are different. And then our one-cost Outlands characters are Knights of the Swan in the Tactics Sphere and the Anphalos Herdsmen in Lore. These only cost one, and they're zero willpower, zero attack, zero defense, and one hit point. And they also have that Outlands trait. So just like Hirluin, all of these characters start off extraordinarily weak, but as soon as one enters play... For every other Outlands character that that player controls, they each receive some sort of bonus. So the Warrior of Losernark boosts defense strength by one. Athir Swordsman boosts willpower strength by one. Knights of the Swan boosts attack strength by one. And the Anphalos Herdsman boosts hit points by one. So, given that all of these characters start off so extraordinarily weak, but they nevertheless have such an extremely powerful ability, the Outlands deck becomes exceptionally powerful during the late game, but early on they're susceptible to all sorts of different effects. So, damage to all character effects can dispatch these Outlands allies very quickly. Or if it just so happens that there's a lot of threat accumulating in the staging area, or you've got beefy enemies engaging with you, it can take quite a bit of time for an Outlands deck to amass enough allies with sufficient willpower or attack strength to overcome what the encounter deck is throwing against them. But if you've got a lot of card draw, if you've got a lot of resource acceleration, and you can get a lot of these allies into play, all of their effects stack upon one another, and you can end up ending the game with an absolutely incomparably powerful force sitting there out on the table. 
I think that this adventure pack, specifically the Outlands card, really changed the game in many ways. One of the things players were discussing in the various discussion boards after this pack came out was this is like the one pack that beginners can pick up and make a pretty good deck uh, in conjunction with the Heirs of Numenor Deluxe expansion and, of course, the core set. And I think in large measure that's true. A lot of the dwarf power cards were really spread across not only the core set, Shadows of Mirkwood with Dane, and, of course, uh, Kaza Doom and the Dwarl Delph cycle, but even the Hobbit boxes. You can't buy one product and have a ready-to-go powerhouse dwarf deck for the outlands all you really need is this one certainly we've got there's outlands cards before there's been some after but you really can build a pretty solid deck i think with with a limited card pool and for some folks that's a plus I'll probably talk more about this at the end with our overall adventure pack review, but the Outlands is something that instantly turned me off. I'm not interested in playing this type of deck in any way, shape, or form, so my review of these cards will always be sort of uh, armchair quarterbacking in the sense that I've not played this particular deck. But it seems to me that the Anphalos Herdsman would be the most important of the set. That's the ally Mitch that you were talking about that boosts the hit points, because you're, you're right. Cards like the Necromancer's Reach, which deal one damage to each exhausted character, uh, whether it's um, any of your allies, if you don't have that hit point boost and you sent them to the quest or they're doing whatever, are instantly wiped out. Or if you hit, you know, if you're playing in a multiplayer game and get multiple cards that deal damage to allies, uh, that could really spell disaster in the early game. So I think that the Outlands could potentially be weak the first couple of turns. Uh, so I think it's going to need a little bit of extra care and attention. And, and the card that, at least to me, not having played this deck, seemed to be pretty important was a very good tail in that you could exhaust some of your allies. And since they're all relatively the same cost, provided you get an ally uh, in the cards that you draw, you're likely to get extra ones on the table for free. So that seems to me, again, to be a card that would be stellar for an Outlands deck. And it helps that it's a leadership card. You just mentioned the concept of resource matches, and something that makes the Outlands deck rather peculiar is that Hirluin the Fair kind of ignores that normally requisite resource match. So even though he's only Leadership Sphere, you can pay for any of the Outlands allies. So whether it's the Hunter of Lamadon and Anphalos Herdsman in lore, whether it's Knights of the Swan from Tactics, or a Thier Swordsman for Spirit, none of that really matters. He's very similar to Elrond in that capacity. And that's why the hero I just mentioned is a natural pick for characters trying to run an Outlands deck, because Outlands starts off so weak and Elrond is so powerful, he can really help to kind of compensate for how mediocre Hirluin's stats are at the beginning of the game. So with that one attack strength, the one willpower, he's really not doing too much. That pool of hit points might allow him to soak up an attack or two while you're still waiting for your Outlands synergy to to really blossom before you're able to fully load the table with those Warriors of Losernok or the Anfalas Herdsmen. And another natural hero pick would be Glorfindel in spirit because he's got Light of Valinor to give him additional actions, so he's questing for quite a bit, he's attacking for quite a bit. Glorfindel and Hirluin both have pretty reasonable threat values, so even if you are running Elrond, your starting threat is still only 26, and having those two formidable heroes to back up Hirluin might just allow players to survive long enough against the onslaught of an Heirs of Numenor and Beyond encounter deck to allow players to really experience the intensity of just how strong Outlands can be if left relatively unchecked by the encounter deck. Another pretty potent combination of heroes to try and get that Outlands deck up and running as quickly as possible is Theodrid, also in the leadership sphere, just like Hirluin, to commit to the quest alongside Hirluin to give him additional resources. And then you've got a natural resource match to get uh, cards into play like Errand Rider, so that you can shift resources from whatever other hero, or Theodred himself, also onto Hirluin the Fair. Because in an Outlands deck, all the different allies are so cheap, normally the major limiting factor is how many resources you can bring to bear each and every round.
In that deck, Barovor serves as a perfect choice because you can exhaust her each and every round to keep adding cards to your hand. So once you search through your decks for effects like Steward of Gondor, some of the other resource acceleration effects that we've seen in the past, or a new resource acceleration effect that we're going to cover in this video, you can literally fill the table with allies. And if you take advantage of effects that were previously kind of taboo, namely peace and thought, because the Outlands characters by themselves eventually get so powerful. For example, either the Aether Swordsman or the Warrior of Losernok can easily reach something like 4 willpower, 4 attack, 4 defense, 4 hit points. That there is above and beyond any hero that we've seen. So once your heroes are almost unnecessary, choosing to exhaust two of them as a refresh action in order to add five additional cards to your hand, only to put more and more Outlands characters into play, is a fantastic value. And, in some select situations, I think it's worth it for solo Outlands players to take a look at maybe on occasion choosing Bilbo Baggins over Barovor, specifically because in the early game, even though he's not drawing you as many cards, he is drawing a little bit of additional willpower, and if you find yourself consistently playing Peace and Thought, whereas Barovor's action is essentially wasted in helping to pay for that card, Card, Bilbo Baggins nevertheless continues to draw you additional cards during your resource phase. So in most situations, and certainly in a multiplayer game, I think Barovor is hands down the better option, but as we slowly start to see some development of the Hobbit synergy, I think Bilbo is definitely worth considering. Taking a look at each of the Outlands characters themselves, the Warrior of Losernok is probably my least favorite, just because unless you're doing a lot of siege questing, having reasonable defense doesn't do you a whole lot because you only start off with that one hit point. So even if you get three Warriors of Losernok in play without Anphalos Herdsman to back that up, it's just the same as having a Defender of Ramas on the table. And if it just so happens that a nasty shadow effect ends up killing one of those characters, then your entire army suffers as a result, which is one of really the only pitfalls of the Outlands deck. Probably one of the most powerful of these allies, though, is the Aether Swordsman. So even though we moved a little bit away from traditional willpower questing during Heirs of Numenor, for a cost of two, you start off with a two willpower ally, which is fantastic and comparable to other allies we've seen, like the West Road Traveler. But as soon as one player plays two of those, each of those characters has three willpower, so for the same cost as two West Road Travelers, instead of getting four willpower, you're getting six. And as soon as you put three into play, that's a grand total of 12 willpower. And again, keep in mind, every other Outlands character you control is getting stronger and stronger. So this ends up just being a ridiculous effect. And if a player does happen to be running Heavy Spirit, they're certainly welcome to take advantage of effects like Stand and Fight, so if Matthew has a Theer Swordsman in his discard pile, because they're still respectable questing ability by themselves, if I pull those into play and it gives all of my characters an additional one willpower, it starts to get absolutely absurd. Our other two Outlands characters that start off so extraordinarily weak with zeros for all of their attributes aren't nearly as exciting, but like Matthew said, the Anphalos Herdsman is absolutely mandatory, and that Knights of the Swan, even though itself isn't doing much, as soon as you put two of them into play, they both have two attack strength for the cost of two. So it's pretty similar to a veteran axe hand at that point, and it only gets better. And once you've got a reasonable amount of attack strength, Herluin the Fair can start to shine, because if you happen to be running tactics, you can use hands upon the bow, great you bow, all sorts of stuff like that. So all in all, having only one adventure pack and that one deluxe expansion with one character at this point to draw from, the Outlands deck has incredible potential, and whether you think it's broken or not, I'm nevertheless very excited to see exactly what FFG has planned for this trait.
So moving on to our leadership cards, we have, well, card, singular, we have Gaining Strength. It is a zero-cost event, and its action reads, discard two resources from your hero's resource pool to add three resources to that hero's resource pool. So it's basically giving you one extra resource with sort of the contingent that you have two to begin with. I certainly think that this is potentially a nice way to keep resources on the Heirs of Numenor version of Boromir, who, uh, when he has one resource on him, he pumps up the attack strength of Gondor allies. It certainly would be nice to help Hirolin pump out even more allies. Uh, he could pump out three one-cost allies uh, with the play of this card, or perhaps one, two, and one, one. Regardless, it, it just makes him pump out more and more. I think it's potentially very powerful in the early game, perhaps less so in the late game when you have things like Steward of Gondor or things like that. I also thought that this might be an interesting combo card with the Blood of Numenor, where you have to spend one resource from the hero's pool to give that hero plus one defense. Uh, so instead of perhaps having two extra defense, he could have three. So it's certainly an interesting card. I'm not, I've not used it. I'm not opposed to it. I think, uh, you know, one of my goals this cycle is always, though it doesn't always succeed, is to try out as many of the new cards in our uh, playthroughs as possible. And, and this is one I'm definitely interested in giving a whirl. This is kind of an odd card. So when Heirs of Numenor came out, we saw Wealth of Gondor, which was a leadership event. It was cost of zero. It was just add one resource to a hero's resource pool, but it had a restriction in that it could only be played on a Gondor hero. Whereas this has a little bit of a cost, so you already have to have two resources sitting on that hero, but you're essentially gaining an additional resource. So there's no reason that this shouldn't just say, if a character already has two or more resources, add an additional one resource. I think this is a natural fit with the Outlands deck, so Hirluin is able to pay for Outlands allies of any sphere, so you definitely want to dump as many resources onto him as you possibly can. I mentioned using Errand Rider to shift one resource, maybe on the first turn, from any other hero to him, and then you can play any number of copies of this card to amass as many resources as possible on Hirluin. And if you just so happen to be doing leadership lore. This also works fantastically with Elrond. Really any sort of deck where you're implementing a lot of card advantage. So this will work for dwarf decks too if you want to hit that five dwarf threshold as quickly as possible. Really the major limiting factor for this card, apart from it can only be used on your heroes, is that unless you have a lot of cards coming in every round, once you get to the mid game, or especially the late game, this really isn't doing very much. So in a top decking situation where you're really counting on drawing something powerful to kind of turn the tide of the battle, this definitely isn't going to do it for you. I really just see this as one tool or one component in an otherwise powerful deck. So, next up is our one remaining tactics card, which is an attachment. It is Gondorian Shield. With a cost of one, it has the traits Armor and Item, and reads, Attach to a Hero Restricted. Limit one per hero. Attached hero gains plus one defense, plus two defense instead, if attached hero has the Gondor trait. So this is basically a tactics version of Dunedain Warning, but if you stick this on a Gondor character, it ends up providing a pretty significant defense boost. And depending on what scenario you're up against, this might just allow players to create an absolute rock-solid wall of a defending character where no enemy attack could possibly break through. I think this is a fantastic card, probably my favorite of the whole adventure pack, which should come as no surprise for, uh, to listeners of our series. Uh, I think it is uh, certainly great for Siege Questing. I think Baragond is a natural fit for this card, bringing his four defense up to six, which would make him not only a stellar defender, of course, as you were saying, Mitch, but a fantastic Siege Quester. I also think, though, the Tactics version of Boromir would be an, a nice fit for this card, because you can keep uh, readying him uh, by raising your threat, and he can defend multiple attacks uh, with a nice, hefty defense. 
My one issue with this card, though, is that it's a restricted attachment, and there are so many good tactics attachments, whether they're weapons or armor, that you only get two. And so it becomes a matter of, do you want two Citadel plates to boost your hit points up by quite a bit? Or are you looking to put on some Spears of the Citadel or uh, the Gondorian Shield? I, I think it's going to depend on uh, the enemies that you're likely to face in that particular encounter deck. Is having a higher defense value better than having a higher hit point value uh, or some of the, the weapons that are restricted that could possibly go on your hero? So all in all, I think it's a stellar card, and I definitely look forward to its use in our playthrough videos. I definitely have to agree. I think this card is fantastic. I love that on Baragond it's free. It almost makes me wish it cost two, just so you'd get as much value as possible out of his ability. But I think this is great. Tactics doesn't have any sort of in-sphere healing, so the more you can decrease that incoming damage, the longer you can have your defensive character last. You can certainly combine this with one Citadel plate, but if you happen to be deciding between the two, it all comes down to asking yourself, just like Matthew pointed out, what kind of enemies are you expecting to go against? So if you have to end up tanking something like a 10 or 11 attack strength attack with Baragond, then you definitely want to include the Citadel plate. But on the flip side, if you've got a lot of small attacks coming in, that one or two extra points of defense that the Gondorian shield can provide can allow one character to defend round after round after round, where if he only had a citadel plate attached, without any ability to heal away that damage, you'd eventually succumb. Another couple heroes that this works fantastically on are Denethor, so he's got three base defense, he's lore, which means he's got an in-sphere match with a burning brand, so he's got healing on his side, if he's got five defense and three hit points, that can become an absolute wall if you don't feel like using Baragond, and he's got the added flexibility of if you don't need him to defend, he can do some encounter deck scrying and rearranging for you. And similarly, Eleanor of the Spirit Sphere, if you don't need her to cancel a treachery, when it comes round to the combat phase, she's got a hefty 4 defense and a reasonable 3 hit points to do some pretty decent defending for you. Up next is our Spirit card, the Ring of Barahir. It's an artifact, an item, and a ring. It has a cost of one. It's an attachment, of course, and it must attach to a hero. And the attached hero gets plus one hit point for each artifact attachment attached to the hero. And if the attached hero is Aragorn, he gains a lore resource icon. So the developers are, of this game are starting to sort of uh, make a lot of Aragorn-specific attachments, and I think that's pretty interesting. There are eight artifacts at this point in the game for general play. Uh, so the treasures from the Hobbit boxes are only specific to those scenarios, so wouldn't always be able to combo with this particular card. I think the most relevant ones are the Calabrian Stone and the Sword that was broken, because those are also Aragorn-specific attachments, or at least they add an extra sort of benefit when attached to Aragorn. And if you're using the leadership version of Aragorn with all of his attachments, then he would be spirit and lore as well with eight hit points and five willpower which i think is nothing to sneeze at so a very interesting card especially if you're a fan of using aragorn as one of your heroes this is one of those cards where the effect starts off as reasonable when it's first introduced but it only has room to improve over time the resource icon ability of this card strikes me as a little bit strange in that it has some built-in redundancy. So if you're using that lore version of Aragorn, then you're not getting the full potential out of this card, just like if you're playing Sword That Was Broken on the leadership version of Aragorn. In my own experience, I've usually used Aragorn in his lore iteration alongside a spirit deck, as opposed to doing spirit leadership. But, if you're taking advantage of Calabrian Stone, that can give Aragorn a spirit resource icon, and in turn, you might just use one of his resources in order to play Ring of Barahir. I like that it itself is an artifact, so at the very least, Aragorn is gaining one hit point. He's a pretty reasonable defensive character all around, with both of his versions having two defense and five hit points. 
The lore version, of course, has that built-in burning brand match, just like we've mentioned before, and both iterations of Aragorn also have that sentinel effect. The problem lies in what artifacts you're actually intending to play on Aragorn. So if you've got Calabrian Stone and you've got Sword that was broken, that's great. I think ideally, in that situation, you're probably getting that plus three hit point boost, which from a spirit card is actually pretty fantastic. Normally I've got to rely on something like tactics to boost up my hit points, but outside of that situation I'm not seeing a whole lot of artifacts being stuck on Aragorn. It's totally possible that players can take advantage of effects like Horn of Gondor, Thror's Key, and Thror's Map, but then you kind of have to ask yourself, are you using those cards for what their intended purpose is, or are you just trying to get this ring to work? That hit point effect is nice, but it almost seems as a little bit of an added bonus, as opposed to something that's absolutely instrumental. And if you've got bad luck of the draw, you never might get that ring of Bera here functioning, so it almost seems like other effects might be much more reliable. It reminds me of just how reluctant players are, in general, to take advantage of effects like Boots of Erebor, even before we saw cards like Hardy Leadership. Really, the only alternative to Aragorn that I can see is using Elrond. So he's a lore character, he's got rock-solid 3 defense, 4 hit points. As soon as you get Vilya on him, if you add Ring of Bera here, that right there brings him up to 6 hit points. Maybe you're using Thror's Key or Thror's Map, but even without those additions, and especially given his healing enhancement ability, Either Aragorn or Elrond, I think, can make for a pretty spectacular defender. You know, I think the biggest drawback to this card is that it's dependent on attachments. And certainly it seems that some of the more recent quests have really had a lot of attachment hate, uh, either treacheries or shadow effects. Uh, certainly the next adventure pack has a card where you have to pay one for each attachment on a character or lose them all. Uh, one resource for each attachment on your character. This would certainly be the death of Aragorn with a pimped out ring here. So I am not the type of player who likes to just beef up my heroes and put tons of attachments on them simply because there has been from since the core set lots of attachment hate in certain scenarios. And so I'd rather sort of even out the playing field, have some attachments on my heroes and some allies and so if you are the type of player that likes to just beef up your heroes with a bunch of attachments, you have to sort of know what encounter decks you're going to be going up against because a lot of them really punish you for really loading up your heroes. With that said, I, I sort of think of this as a song card. A uh, Song of Wisdom costs one. It gives a character lore, uh, the lore icon. So if you're playing with a leadership version of Aragorn, to me this is just a song, and so I do sort of think the hit point is just an added bonus. And so you're not only getting the value of a song, you also get at least one extra hit point. But again, like I mentioned a moment ago, if you're doing the at least the other two Aragorn attachments, Sword That Was Broken and the Calabrian Stone, I really don't think you can sneeze at an eight hit point hero with five willpower that's just fantastic and so i haven't used aragorn in quite a while but it, it certainly is tempting to think of him having such uh hefty stats i think my final thought on this card is even though it's very cool conceptually this could easily fall prey to that which so many other cards do where they sound great in theory but the amount of work to actually get them functioning consistently or to the height of their potential could be such that in the long term it's just not worth it. So it's certainly good as a little bit of an added bonus if it just so happens to fill the role of a song in your deck like you mentioned, but I would hesitate to try and sculpt a deck around this concept. But on to our one remaining lore card of this adventure pack, which is Mithrandir's Advice. It's a one-cost event and reads, Action. Draw one card for each hero you control with a printed lore resource icon. So, if it just so happens that you're playing mono lore with three heroes that all begin the game with that lore resource icon, this is fantastic. It's the same effect as a Lorien's Wealth, but for one-third of the cost. 
Yeah, there seem to be two dominant themes at this point in the Against the Shadow a cycle of adventure packs. Uh, when Mitch and I are recording this, Encounter at Amon Din just released a couple of days ago. And the major themes seem to be, or at least the sub-themes of this cycle, are Outlands. We seem to get a few Outland cards every pack. And then uh, Monosphere cards. And so this is sort of the first of the Monosphere ones that we're taking a look at. Other than that, I think it completely outshines Daron's Runes. It's just a fantastic card if you're playing Mono Lore. I, I can't imagine not using this card uh, if you're playing Mono Lore. It's just, for the cost, it's just absolutely fantastic. Really, the biggest trick with getting this card to function is you are pretty restricted as to what heroes you use. So if you're only running two lore heroes, for one resource, drawing two cards still seems like it's a pretty good deal, but is it worth it to you to draw one card for one resource? At that point, it starts to make Darren's Runes, which is draw two, discard something from your hand, look a little bit more favorable. It's kind of a shame that this requires your characters to have printed resource icons, so if it just so happens that you're taking advantage of effects like Ring of Barahir or Song of Wisdom, that isn't going to cut it. So it doesn't allow you to take advantage of this monosphere effect if you're still doing that sphere blending. I think with any sort of card advantage effect, it's very important for the players to take advantage of some sort of resource acceleration, so even though Master of Lore has kind of fallen from grace, Lore doesn't really have a whole lot else to provide in the form of resource acceleration, so unless you've got another player helping you, being able to fill your hand with cards, which, let's face it, should be what a mono lore deck is all about, might give you a lot of options, but you might find yourself awfully limited as to what you can actually put onto the table. And that leads us to our final card of the Adventure Pack. It's a neutral, zero-cost event, a good harvest. Action, name a sphere. Until the end of the phase, you can spend resources of any sphere when paying for cards that belong to the name sphere. And Caleb Grace, through some conversations with players, has ruled that a good harvest does not allow players to play zero-cost cards without a resource match. Since you are not using any resources to pay for the card, the ability of a good harvest does not apply, and you would still need a resource match. With that said, I still think it's a pretty good card. It's You can sort of think of it as an insta-song, certainly to help a hero like Hirulin, to help his hero companions help him pump out a few more allies. And I think it could maybe even potentially be helpful in the late game, when a character has an o overload of unused resources but don't have any in-sphere cards to play, you could use this to help uh, spread the love a little bit. So it's a, a very interesting card. I haven't used it yet, but I definitely see potential. This is definitely an interesting utility card. So it only functions one time for one sphere, but it influences all heroes that you control. So unlike a song played on one character or Narvi's belt that either persists or is a repeatable effect, this only works till the end of the phase, not the end of the round, but it allows all of those heroes to put their resources together to pay for cards from one specific sphere of influence. To me, this is pretty similar to gaining strength, where if you don't have a lot of card advantage, this can certainly fall prey to being a very weak draw, but just like you mentioned, Matthew, there have been countless times, especially earlier on in our video series, where we've gotten closer to the end of the game and we've found one hero with something like five to eight unspent resources. Maybe if a character is running effects like Desperate Alliance and they have that character laden with resources, they can shift him over to another player, and that player can take advantage of an effect like this, so maybe they use Glowin's leadership resources to pay for all of their spirit or lore cards. I think this is definitely good when players are taking advantage of multiple spheres of influence doing tri or even quad sphere decks, so if you're being ambitious, if you're taking some pretty significant risks in order to hit it big, this can provide a little bit of insurance for you. But I think that about covers the new hero and nine new player cards of the Steward Sphere Adventure Pack. But Matthew, any overall impressions or thoughts on all of these cards? 
Well, I think that with the introduction of the Heirs of Numenor Deluxe expansion, players were really expecting to have Gondor Synergy develop. And as I mentioned a moment ago, the third adventure pack of this cycle has now been released as of a couple days ago, and we still don't really have a development of the Gondor trait, I think, like people expected. It's been Outlands, and it's been Monosphere. Monosphere we sort of knew, because I think the preview articles were discussing that, Heirs of Numenor touch on Gondor a little bit. Certainly Boromir has his ability to pump up Gondor allies. Envoy of Pelargir can place a resource on a Gondor hero. But this pack, the, the Gondor is really nowhere to be seen. With the exception of the Gondorian shield being a little bit better on a Gondor hero. So... Uh, it's a little hard for me to review this particular adventure pack. I'm trying to be fair, <laughs> as I always try to do, but I am, as I mentioned a moment ago, relatively turned off by Hirluin and the Outlands. I honestly have no desire to try this. With each adventure pack that comes out, there's another Outlands card, and I'm just like, ugh. I'm not a card designer. I can't even fathom designing cards for this game. I really give Matt and Caleb a lot of props. I really think they're doing a good job. But at the same time, I feel like these Outland characters are woefully undercost and, and grossly overpowered. If I was designing the cards, and again, take this for what it's worth, all of them would have had zero stats and probably cost two, maybe even three. As we'll see in the next two adventure packs, there's even better Outlands cards coming. And it just sort of makes me mad uh, in the sense that it just seems so plop and play. As I mentioned in our The Battle of Lake Town playthrough, one thing I like about that quest so much is that you actually have to think about what you're doing. Each decision means something. And I feel like with Outlands, it's just get all your allies on the table as quickly as possible and never think again because you have 444s sitting on the table. And that, to me, again, it's just not my play style. Sure, I think it gives new players a fantastic entry into the game, but I think it's a style of deck that would get old quite often, and it's going to force, I think, FFG to make encounter sets that in the early game punish you uh, for having low hit point allies to keep this sort of deck style from being overwhelming. There was a glutton of videos, playthroughs by other folks, most of which were very good, demonstrating the power of the Outlands deck a solo, and they just stomp almost every single quest. And I don't that just I don't like that. I I don't I want to win certainly. I don't want to lose, but to stomp every single quest, sometimes just using Herolin or maybe Herolin and one other, here Luwin, I think I keep saying this name wrong, and one other hero. I don't know. that Again, I, to me, they seem overpowered and undercosted. So with that said, I think the only card I really like out of this adventure pack is the Gondorian Shield. Uh, certainly, I think the ring has some interest. If I were ever to play mono lore, certainly Mithrandir's advice is fantastic. A good harvest has some use, but out of the 10 cards, the only one that would ever make it into my currently existing decks is the Gondorian Shield. I'll talk more what I, about what I think about the quest when we get to that particular video, but all in all, it's for me personally in my own play style, the type of decks that I build, a very underwhelming adventure pack. If memory serves, we were first introduced to the Outlands characters in a spoiler article that showed off the Aether Swordsman, so even though that by itself is exceptionally powerful, I wasn't really drawn to this kind of play allies that all influence and enhance one another's style of play. Having actually taken the time to build a few different Outlands decks, tried different assortments of heroes, and having tried to fine-tune some combination of characters that really gets this to work, I kind of found that Outlands is a lot more difficult to get functioning in the early game than I originally thought it was. So in a single-player environment, of course you're only dealing with one encounter card per turn, but if your deck is full of all zero or all one allies, you can definitely flounder in the early game. And whereas other decks might be relatively powerful starting off and only amp up over time, I found that the Outlands deck doesn't exactly hit face roll mode as quickly as I was expecting it to. I definitely think it's easy to take a look at the Outlands deck and just say, oh my god, this is so insanely overpowered having every single character with fours or threes as all of its attributes, and it certainly can feel that way if you get a little bit lucky with getting these characters into play. But at the present moment, 
I think the Outlands provides kind of a nice alternative to players that are so used to relying on dwarves as their one and only top tier style deck list. What I think is kind of shocking to myself and the community as a whole is just how quickly the Outlands has become so ridiculously powerful. Just like you said yourself, it feels very plop and play when, for instance, players can just buy one adventure pack and it provides a complete framework to get this Outlands deck functioning. So it gives you a hero that allows you to pay for any of your different characters. It provides a host of powerful characters. It has a built-in resource acceleration effect and a resource fixing effect that work pretty well in an Outlands deck. This is just nothing like we've ever seen before in that it's an adventure pack that is so laser focused on developing one trait or one style of play that it just absolutely blows me away. So I'm excited to see what FFG does with Outlands. They've already established themselves as immensely powerful. Like you mentioned, uh, we've seen playthroughs where characters beat Journey Along the Anduin with Hirluin the Fair as their only hero. And players have used this and some Heirs of Numenor cards and maybe a handful of others here and there, and they've handily stomped Lake Town. So I'll definitely be giving Outlands a shot in our videos, and I'm curious to see how they continue to perform over time. Yeah, you know, after my rant about the Outlands, and I, and I think I mean what I say, the other difficulty, I think, and we'll certainly encounter this more in the Druidan Forest and counter at Amon Din Adventure Packs, is the Monosphere uh, sub-theme, and that I haven't played Monosphere, I don't think, since the Corset days, when I tried out each deck individually before I then combined them. And since we're only gaining one or two Monosphere cards per pack, you know, we only get 10 cards a pack, uh, so the card pool never grows all that much each month, it's going to be a little bit tough to evaluate these fairly, especially since it's been two some years since I played anything Monosphere, and again, that was back in the Corset days. So I think for some cards like Mithrandir's Advice, it's very easy to see the power of that card. Other of these Monosphere cards I think will be harder for me to evaluate, but I think I can save that for for future videos. But again, all in all, this pack doesn't add a whole lot of cards to my existing decks, and I don't particularly care for making a Mono Lore or an Outlands deck after the release of this pack. So definitely not my favorite pack ever. But uh, I'm certainly looking forward to the playthrough of this new quest and seeing what the rest of the cycle has in store for us. I think as my closing thought, I'll just say that my own thoughts about the Monosphere cards is they have such big shoes to fill, in a way. I mean, the reason that players play two, three, or even four Sphere decks in the first place is because each different Sphere has so many powerful cards that are pretty much unique to that Sphere. Or, if you're taking advantage of some sort of effect that another Sphere excels in, it can be much more expensive or difficult to get into play. There are certainly some cases where Monosphere decks are already pretty powerful, but they nevertheless take advantage of cards from other spheres. Uh, the example that comes immediately to mind is the Mono Leadership Dwarf deck, where you've got Dane, Thorin, and Balin, but because of that card Narvi's Belt, you can nevertheless take advantage of all four different spheres of influence. So, outside of situations like that, I think we're going to need a lot of extremely powerful monosphere effects before I consider trying to build around it. And I really hope it doesn't only end up being another secrecy. Yeah, I, I thought I was done, but I think my final, final thought is that if you think about it, not counting heroes, we only get 12 new cards a sphere per cycle, right? Six adventure packs? two cards of each sphere, and sometimes that's not even the case. Uh, you certainly could add in the deluxe box to that, but the card pool just doesn't grow that much, and so it's hard to do a lot for a monosphere deck when you're only getting 12 lore cards, 12 tactics cards, whatever, plus the heroes, and maybe whatever was in the deluxe box, but if memory serves, there was nothing monosphere-ish in uh, Heirs of Numenor, so I, I don't have high hopes for it being developed all that well, but it's not that they have to be perfect decks, just that they can, I think, hold their their own, and certainly perhaps Monosphere decks will shine more in multiplayer than a solo player trying to do everything on their own with one sphere. So yeah, lots of exciting things I think to look for in this set of adventure packs, and I really can't wait to know what's coming up next. 
I definitely think one of the biggest limitations for you and I in analyzing any of these cards is that I can count the number of three player games I've played on one hand, and I have never played a four player game. So certainly if it's four players each running a different sphere, those could be pretty powerful decks. I just don't have that experience. I uh, don't have any local gamers to interact with, so... Be sure to let us know in the comments below if you've got some different opinions. Matthew and I are always glad to read about what someone else's thoughts are about any of these cards, but I think we've about said as much as we can about this fascinating adventure pack. So, as always, thank you guys for checking out another entry in the LOTR LCG progression series. If you enjoyed what you saw, be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our channel if you have not done so already. Up next, we're going to be taking a look at the very first of our Against the Shadows scenarios, The Steward's Fear. So we'll see you again soon.